Hi, this is Roger from Kanker Labs today with a kind of special edition of the Vintage Display Technology video series. Uh, this time with two models of the famous Berlin clock or in German Berlin Uhr, which some also know as Mengenlehre Uhr, which translates as set theory clock, although the display has nothing to do with the set theory. Now first of all you might wonder why is this in the vintage display technology? Well these are only models obviously with LEDs of the original clock and I'll come back in a minute to the uh, original clock which in fact is kind of a vintage display. And I had to pull out these two models from storage uh, because of a talk I'm giving in November about vintage display technologies. And so this Berlin Uhr is so famous in Germany because it was for some decades standing at the Kurfürstendamm or Kudamm in Berlin at a very prominent position at a traffic crossing. And I will show you pictures of the original uh, later. Uh, first of all you can see why I had to pull them out from storage. Differences in brightness. I can show you how these LED blocks look like. I think they are from King Bright and the smaller ones um, they have two LEDs inside and the larger ones they have all in all six LEDs. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, anyway uh, this model of the original is built from a modified circuit that was published in Elector magazine in around 1980. I'll show you the, the circuit diagram and the modifications I made later. And this is a commercial model, a very sought after for, which still sells today for more than 250 euros. So it is produced for more than four decades, I think. And you can see also here, that's why we have to open this up. Uh, this, this LED here, it looks a bit dimmer than the other ones so either there's something wrong with the position because they are some some kind of Fresnel lenses in front of it either the position is wrong or this LED or the driver pin there's something wrong with it anyway how does this clock work you can already see here the top light is blinking in two seconds mode so one second on one second off then the lowermost row there you count the minutes. The one above that each LED has a value of five minutes. So if we count this and the little red ones are quarters of an hour. So we now have 15, 30, 35, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44 minutes. The, the clocks are not 100% in sync. So now they are again showing the same time. So we have 30, 40, 44 minutes at the moment and the same principle is here above. The big red ones in the third row they count as one hour and the row above that is five hours so we have five, six, seven, eight hours. So it's eight o'clock and now we have 44 minutes. So th this is a very strange system for a clock. Uh, to, to read the time. Of course it takes you much too long, even, especially if this clock is standing at the traffic crossing. Uh, you, you simply don't have the time to count all the values together. And the original came out in the 1970s and there it was just kind of hip. It was the next big thing at that time just to display time in a futuristic digital way. And so let's go back a little bit into the history of this clock. So here are a few pictures of the inventor uh, Dieter Binninger who originally was a watchmaker and only later became an inventor. He was kind of a bit obsessed with his set theory uh, clock. You can see him here holding the little model you just saw a few minutes ago in real life. And here are some photos when he was older. But but that photo was taken about the time when also the original, the large seven meter high clock was built. 
just to promote his idea of the set theory clock. He even uh, made the large seven meter high original clock as a present to, to Berlin. And here, here you can see it standing on the Kudam. At the back is the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche and um, it stood there from 1975 to 1995 and it was quite famous in Germany because during the time when the Berlin Wall still existed, when you were driving from West Germany to uh, West Berlin, you usually came out at the Kurfürstendamm and the first thing you saw at the first crossing was the famous Berlin Wall. And all the nerds and geeks, although they weren't called that at that time, and they of course knew about this clock. Here's another picture where it was originally standing and here you can better see the original display technology. It were just incandescent light bulbs. The clock was illuminated with or the single digits were illuminated with and you can already now see that the proportions of the original are not very good represented in the little model here. So that's why I made clock of my own, which much more resembles the proportions and the form factor of the original clock. So, and what's also interesting about this clock is that it was the model and I think also the original, they were driven with uh, one of the first or perhaps the first microcontroller, the famous TMS-1000. And uh, we'll just in a minute take apart the model, uh, just to take a look at how it was built inside. And I think the model was uh, even available nearly at the same time when, when the big one was built. So it must have been in the mid 70s. And if you make a Google search for Berlin, well, you can see a lot of pictures of the original and of the model and the clock is now uh, still running and it st can still be seen at the Europa Center in Berlin where it is exhibited and you can see it's really still working. All right here we have the schematic for the Berlin Uhr model and you can see central is the TMS 1000 microcontroller. As far as I remember that was in PMOS logic so CMOS was not available at that time in 1974 when it came out and you can see here the supply voltage is minus 15 volts so here ground is the highest potential or voltage and it all operates with a negative supply voltage and we have two TTL ICs. These are segment and digit drivers, the SN74491 and 492, uh, usually used to drive a string of seven segment displays. But here you can see uh, the LEDs for the display are just connected to the segment and digit outputs. And it also operates here just to connect it with the PMOS logic with minus seven volt and ground. And the seconds indicator is uh, just directly connected to some outputs of the TMS 1000. And of course, uh, as is usually done when you have limited uh, pins available, the keys for setting the clock and the alarm display and the alarm time, etc., they are in parallel, just separated with uh, some diodes in parallel with the uh, segment outputs. So, and where does it get its time signal from? You can see there's no quartz, but here we have a clock signal input, and that is on the other PCB. And this is the power supply. Where do we get the clock signal? Here we have a dual monoflop, and that is used on the one side, it gets the 50 Hertz mains frequency here coming in and kind of filtered TTL level or PMOS level uh, clock output. And the other half of the monoflop is just used for a little buzzer here for the alarm. And you can see also the LM317 is used kind of, well not backwards, but you can see the output here is ground because it's the highest potential. And 
the minus 7 volts here for the segment and digit drivers. Uh, that is what usually is ground in, in a standard configuration, but because this is the lowest potential, ground in fact is the regulated output and the ground of the circuit is in fact then minus 7 volts, so 7 volts below the regulated output. So and the minus 15 volts for the microcontroller for the TMS1000 and for this single standard CMOS IC, the CD4093, that is just with a secondary winding of the transformer and regulated only with a Zener diode. So and just a little personal story why I'm so obsessed with this uh, clock. I got this as a present from my father uh, when I was, I don't know, 12, 13 years around. And he himself had got it as a gift, uh, so he didn't pay for it. It was just a uh, marketing object at that time for some pharmaceutical companies. And this clock was running just for just a few weeks and then it didn't work anymore. The keys didn't react anymore and the clock simply wasn't running. And of course I took it apart, but I didn't have the ability, there was no circuit diagram, so there was nothing for me to measure. I could, I could only see, verify that the LEDs were still okay, but I didn't have an oscilloscope, I just had a simple analog multimeter, and I couldn't find out what was wrong, and even at that time there were problems with the electrolytic capacitors. And the problem was that here the main filter cap capacitor, this 1000 microfarad, it just was uh, broken. As, as, in, as we often find today that uh, when a circuit doesn't work anymore, uh, just look for the, for the electrolytics. Even though this was not a switched mode power supply, but apparently this electrolytic was of bad quality or it was kind of overstressed. However, if I had known that at the time, you only had to change the electrolytic and the clock would be running again. But so I didn't know what to do with it. And instead of keeping it for repair, perhaps later, I just threw it away. And then decades later, I wanted to, to get uh, the clock back again that I owned in my youth. And of course, Thanks to the internet, I could quickly find out what was the problem at that time. And it simply was the electrolytic in the power supply. So, and if you search on eBay, on the German eBay site for Berlin Uhr with the addition of Binning of the name of the inventor, you can find the model for buy at once or buy immediately for quite substantial prices. Remember that the clock knew the model sells now for less than 238 uh, bucks. So uh, this, this clock is quite sought after and I'm always searching for a defective one because I know uh, th that this thing can be repaired. And my one, I think I bought this for 50 euros or something like that, uh, sold as defective and the only thing that had to be replaced was the, was the electrolytic. But now there could be something wrong with one of the LEDs as we saw, the one in the left lower left corner. And you can even find a data sheet for the LEDs uh, because the company is still in existence. And if we take a look at here, they are they are they have a designation BCR 180 and BCA 180, depending on if it's the yellow or the red one. And we can find this here just in reverse order: 100, 180 BCR and BC8, and that is uh, amber and red. So they are they could probably even be bought uh, today. And for that time, they were quite efficient. They are relatively bright. So I remember LEDs from that age, from, from the mid 70s, that, that are barely visible when they are turned on. But these ones here are relatively bright. So now next is, uh, let's take this thing apart and see if we find, can find anything. Uh, if there's something wrong with uh, the lower left LED.
So let's see what we can find if we open this thing up. So here on the back we will find the PCB with the LEDs and I think there's nothing more. And I can't remember in which direction one had to take this apart. Ah, okay. Yeah, now we could already take off the front cover with the kind of Fresnel uh, lenses. And here we beautifully can see the LEDs. Interestingly, the t ah, I think these two red ones here at the top seconds indicator, they are for the, for the two alarm times uh, indicating them. And so nothing very interesting to see. I'll just turn it on just to see if we can see if here this when you switch it on all the LEDs are flashing so one has to set or start to set the time and yeah I think here there's something wrong with the lower left LED it, it just looks like it's well it's not strange it looks like that the chip inside is not really centered so depending on how you tilt it the brightness changes with all of these just put on a few more of the LEDs. So they are all not very sitting, they're not very straight and that's at least part of where the brightness difference comes from. But when I look at them at an angle I can see that the, the chip is not always centered in, in the acrylic or in the plastic. So, and for example here the color and the brightness of this LED here is completely different uh, to the other ones. So at that time uh, that was probably not very consistent how you could get your LEDs. And we only have a flat cable connector so oh strange solar wire bridges that they made here looks like a lot of uh, let me show you a lot of botch wires that were required here let me see if I can pull off the connector yeah okay this is the the PCB from seen from the back and a lot of well wire bridges they are probably not botch wise ah, you can see here this LED has already once been either replaced or desoldered so I will try to get a replacement for this one here and now when they are off I can really even see that the chip inside is always at a different, it's, it's not consistently centered. Sometimes it's sitting right on the edge. Okay, so nothing more to see here on the display side. So let's, let's take apart the main PCB with the transformer. You can see a little trimmer here that's for the brightness of the of the LEDs so that you can set them in also in your bedroom in a kind of night mode with reduced 
brightness. So what do we have? All in all five Phillips screws. And here you can see also uh, the back label that has survived. The, usually there's also a label here and here. They have somehow vanished <laughs> over time. But here you can see the serial number. So there were only a little more than 10,000 of these things have sold, even patented. And apparently you can even, uh, there must be a jumper wire to set this from 50 to 60 hertz. Because we could also see at the transformer, it had two primary windings. So this thing can also be used uh, with 110 volts and 60 hertz apparently. And there's even the, the old address of the company where Dieter Binninger was living. Zwickauer Damm 60 to 64. And the old postal codes, 1 Berlin 47. So, uh, one last screw, and then we should be inside. All right, so we have two PCBs. Here with the two driver TTL ICs and the famous TMS 1000. Let me see if we can get a date code. It looks like I can't bear, can barely read this, but this looks like 8010. So it's it's from 1980 apparently. This must have been nearly the first batch of the clocks and here you can see already how much this has turned black that the layout of the power supply was uh, simply not sufficient um, let's see if we can get this out So it looks like these two screws here, they are holding the transformer. And if we turn them loose, then yeah, now we're having it. And it's still very warm, not to say hot. And you can see this, this was clearly laid out insufficiently, especially because uh, our mains voltage here in Germany, it has risen from original to 20 volts to 230 volts now, plus minus 10%. So you can see uh, how, how black this the PCB has turned. And um, these are already replaced electrolytic caps. Uh, both of the main filter caps have been replaced by me. And here we can see the little CMOS IC with the dual monoflops, the, um, the little buzzer. And uh, you can see even some traces have, uh, have burned through or are no longer usable after that time and the heavy loading. So this is, I think I remember this is, was from me just to repair this thing and the I think the original LM uh, 317 it I can't remember exactly but I think this is no longer the original one so uh, at least we have found that uh, apparently this one LED here on the lower left has to be replaced it's and it already has been replaced once the way it looks. And so um, I'll put this thing back together again and we'll take a look at the other model. So this is a scan of the original article in Electron Magazine from May 1980 
where they gave a little description of the Berlin Uhr, how it works, in how the display works in the original, and then a clever circuit which we'll take a look at more closely in a second. Uh, just to realize the functionality of the Berlin Uhr just with the standard TTL and CMOS ICs. So and this is the circuit in detail. We just need again a 50 Hz reference and that's why we also need a transformer and not only 5 volt DC. So uh, apart from the 7805 regulator, the signal here, the 50, or in this case, because it's a bridge rectifier, you get 100 hertz, and it is limited with a Zener diode, and then goes into a one half of a dual mono flop, and it is conditioned here just to give a clean TTL pulse, and this is a 74123, and so we have a clean 100 hertz TTL signal. Then we get a chain of four dividers. First of all, we divide by 10 with a 7490 configured as a divide by 10 divider. Another one divide by 10. So at this point here, we have one hertz. And the next 7490, in fact, the 7490s, they have two divider stages. And the first one is a divide by two. So here we get our two seconds display for the, the LED on top here. Uh, that is one second on and one second off. Just buffered here with a little inverter. And so all in all here, the output is the second signal divided by 10. And then we still have divided by six. And this is done with a 7492. And so here we have a signal that goes high and low every minute. And you can see here for setting the clock, we have a little 555 timer with a, varia with a potentiometer so that you get variable speed. And with this little push button, which is of the type normally closed, when you push this down, then the push button opens and all of the, the divider stages, they are reset at that moment. And this OR gate here, um, it gets its inputs on the one side from our divider stages. So here at this point, we have our one minute signal, but because all the stages are reset here during setting of the time, it also gets its signals here from the 555 timer. And so then we, it goes through an inverter and then ca comes a chain of shift registers. Uh, here we have a 7496, that's a 5-bit shift register. And the only different one is here the 74164, which is an 8-bit shift register. And all the others are again 5-bit shift registers. And there at the output, we have our one minutes output, the chain of five minutes LEDs. Then we have our one hour LEDs and our five hour LEDs. And by a clever use of the remaining inverters and OR gates, all the minutes and the hours are reset at the correct points, for example, our five one minute LEDs are reset here. When the fifth bit, the output here goes high, then it automatically resets all of its outputs. And the same is done here when the, the five minute LEDs are kind of full so that we get a one hour impulse. Then here with this inverter, they are both reset. And the only thing that's a bit more complicated is that when we reach 24 hours, then we need a clever combination of the inverters and an OR gate just to get a reset signal here. 
that also resets the monoflop. And so that that is basically all. And the only thing I've changed in my version That is, I've replaced, if available, all of the TTL ICs with HCMOS ICs. For example, I'm using uh, 74HC164 shift registers. And so I think with most of, of the TTL ICs, I got a more or less matching um, HCMOS equivalent. Though not, not necessarily a, a pin compatible uh, replacement, uh, but just a functional replacement. And you can see here is the bridge rectifier, the 7805, some filter caps. And the other modification, here you can see the push button, which is normally closed, the potentiometer for setting the speed uh, of the setting. And the other thing I changed, I've connected the outputs of the shift registers. They are not able to drive directly all of the LEDs. Uh, I've, so I've put some driver chips, the venerable ULN2003, in between. And that is because, um, I don't know if you, if this becomes clear. So that's the back side of the LED panel. And uh, as you can see, these block LEDs consist of of multiple LEDs, either two or six, depending of if it if it are the smaller ones or the bigger ones. And I just put all of the here in the big blocks, all of these six LEDs in series, and they are driven with a higher voltage from a secondary DC power. And so I needed uh, much less current limiting resistors and this is just more power efficient if you put the, the multiple LEDs in series instead of all of them in parallel with, with a current limiting resistor for each one of them. So you can see there's only one resistor for each kind of segment and each segment, for example here, the big blocks here, the, which are nearly square-like, um, they consist all of all out of 12 LEDs inside because these are two large block LEDs with six LEDs times two makes 12 LEDs. And it's just easier to have them all in series and then have a, I don't know what I took, 20 volts or something like that as a DC source. And you can see for each block, there's only a sim single current limiting resistor. So that was all. If you're interested in the circuit diagram, uh, you can make a simply a screenshot here of this one or ask me if I can send you the scans. And I've looked it up. I can't find my hand-drawn circuit diagram for the modified uh, circuit, but it's easy to build this by your own if you want to. Or if you ask, perhaps I'll, I'll find it somewhere. So, so that was it for today. Um, if you liked it, please give it a big thumbs up and you can support me on Patreon and hope to see you next time. Bye from Roger. Bye from Kanka Labs.